welcome back to this uh, new session. And uh, now I have uh, the honor to introduce uh, Adrian Bird, who is a geneticist and molecular biologist focusing on the biology of the genome and genomic regulation. Uh, and he holds the Buchanan Chair of Genetics at the University of Edinburgh among many other functions and honors. And his research focuses on understanding DNA methylation and CPG ions and their role in diseases such as Red Syndrome. So thank you very much for your work. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be at any meeting, as has been said, but a particular meeting in the Israel, where I've uh, never been before. I was locked up last night waiting for my certificate of cleanliness, but uh, came through in the middle of the night, so I'm now relatively free. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to talk, as the title suggests here, about uh, the way in which uh, cell stability is, um, is stabilized, and I'll start with a few um, probably unnecessary to all of you uh, statements. Different cell types have the same genome. Uh, there's some immune cells which, which don't, but it's uh, by and large everybody's got the same genome, and yet the cells vary in, in ways that are pictured here uh, and more. Uh, and gene expression programs, as was emphasized, uh, Eric Davidson's belief, uh, I, I would agree that it's primarily due to transcription factors because they're really the only proteins that can tell one bit of the genome from another by reading the DNA sequence. Um, a sort of consequence of that statement, though, is that if you were to take a nucleus and put it into a different cytoplasm, then it should change its identity. And actually, um, we all got used to accepting that uh, that isn't the case. Uh, it's very, very difficult to switch a cell from one cell type to another. So, so while we were sort of uh, surprised and uh, uh, that, that um, at Gerns' experiments with frogs, where he takes a nucleus from a, a skin cell or something and turns it into a, uh, a tadpole, or of course Dolly the sheep, which was made in, in Edinburgh, where I'm from, uh, or Yamanaka's more systematic uh, changing of cells. In a way, the most remarkable thing was that it took so long to be able to do that, given that everybody's got all the instructions in every cell. Um, and the, the way in which this is usually diagrammed, almost uh, tediously diagrammed, is, is this uh, picture, which we've all seen very, very often, uh, which Waddington, who was a Buchanan professor before the Buchanan professor before the Buchanan professor before me, um, <laughs> uh, drew this uh, diagram of uh, the epigenetic landscape. And this ball, when it gets to the bottom, it's, it's decided what sort of a cell it's going to be. And there is the, the fact that it's decided is, is symbolized by the fact that there are slopes here, which prevent it from accidentally sliding into another um, fate. And so um, the difficulty of turning the clock back, so to speak, uh, is because it's difficult to go from here to here or from here to here. So um, my talk's really about one, I'm a reductionist, molecular biologist, so uh, I'm afraid it's going to be about trying to forage among the molecular details to try to understand how that sort of thing happens and what one understands usually and that is one way in which it happens, not several. And one of the uh, mechanisms that is often invoked uh, to explain uh, that resistance to change is consolidation of gene expression programs because uh, gene expression is what determines what a cell is like. Um, by things like DNA methylation. So this is an introduction to DNA methylation on one slide. There's the methyl group, carbon and three hydrogens, sort of nutty little um, group that gets added to DNA uh, after the DNA is, is synthesized. So um, it's not there, it's not incorporated when this DNA is synthesized, when it replicates, but it's added afterwards. It doesn't alter the genetic code. Uh, it's mostly in the sequence CG, CG uh, followed by, which is paired on the other side by CG because the strands are anti-parallel. Uh, and not all the CGs are methylated, so there's a pattern. And I could talk about the pattern, what the pattern means, but I'm not really going to deal with that very much at this point. 
instead I'm going to uh, just give a historical point that one of the ways of trying to find out what this pattern means what the, is, is to find proteins that read it. And a protein that we found really uh, back in the Stone Age was uh, this protein, uh, which I'm going to talk about, it's called MECP2 or MECP2, if you uh, prefer a simpler, but prefer two syllables uh, to however many it is for. Uh, and what we found is that there's this protein which will bind to DNA without going into the assay when it's methylated. But if you give it the same piece of DNA without methylation, it cannot uh, bind to it. And this, this is due to an interaction which we can now understand in atomic detail. This protein can tell where methyl groups are, it binds to them. Uh, and there are the two methyl groups of different colors in the DNA, and we know how it does that. So uh, that was the beginning of a sort of voyage that was um, given a different perspective when um, we found out that uh, this, well, we didn't find it out, but actually Ruda Zobby's lab found it in Houston, in Texas. She found that uh, a syndrome called Rett syndrome uh, is caused almost entirely by mutations that inactivate this protein that we had found in biosymmetric DNA. And weaker mutations cause X-linked intellectual disability and too much MECP2, interestingly, is as bad as too little. Uh, it causes a uh, MECP2 duplication syndrome. The reason why these are all girls is because the genes on the X chromosome. Um, females have two X chromosomes. One of them will have a mutation on. The other one compensates. Actually, there's X inactivation going on, so they inactivate different chromosomes. I can go into that if people want to hear about it. Um, uh, so, so that's, uh, and in the case of MECP du duplication, because males only have one X chromosome, and in the, and in the case of Rett syndrome, I should say, males only have one X chromosome, if it has this mutation on, then those, those uh, kids do not survive. Uh, so there is no Rett syndrome for boys, merely because it's so severe that they do not survive. Uh, like everything else, on, all other X linked uh, disorders, they're more severe in males than females. Um, so these girls survive because uh, they've got uh, uh, the unmutated gene, but at the price of having Rett syndrome. And duplication syndrome mainly affects boys because suddenly you end up with twice as many as, uh, rather than uh, uh, a little bit more, which you get in females. In fact, it affects both sexes, and this is at least as severe as this. In fact, it's more severe so far. Survival here is about um, into the 20s. Uh, whereas uh, it's uh, much greater than that now, at least in the West. Uh, um, yeah, uh, Rett syndrome, um, people with Rett syndrome can survive into their 50s and 60s, but they need nursing, full time nursing during that period. So one of the things that we did first in order to address both these things is how does, how does this give rise to, how does, it, does, it, how does DNA methylation do anything? Uh, and, and we wanted to know a little bit about Rett syndrome as well, it was make a, an animal model. And uh, this just shows that um, if you put those mutations, uh, this is a knockout, but actually uh, the mutations do the same thing, then the males don't survive Female mice are fine for six months, which means you can breed them on and keep the line. But then at six months, they hit a wall, and then they get chronic uh, phenotypes that resemble uh, Rett syndrome. There's breeding arrhythmia, which you see in Rett syndrome, and there's all sorts of other uh, features that make this actually quite a good model for the disease. Everything that we've done so far suggests that what this protein, MECP2, does in mice and what it does in humans is the same. So, um, I'll just tell you a few things about it. It's, it becomes much more abundant in a mouse a few days after, after birth and in humans a few months after birth. It's highly expressed in the brain. Um, and these histograms just re uh, reflect different regions of the brain, uh, forebrain, midhind brain, cerebellum, etc., less in the cerebellum, spinal cord. But it's on everywhere. It's a protein that's needed in every cell type. It's a protein that's present in every cell type. It's not needed there, I'll say, at the moment. 
The other interesting thing here is it's incredibly abundant. There are some nearly 17 million molecules in a, in a nucleus of a neuron, uh, and this is compared to you know 10 to the fourth, 10 to the fifth molecules of a standard transcription factor. It's orders of magnitude. So there's enough virtually to coat the whole genome. And when we look at the phenotype of the mice, we could ask, um, is it, um, if you knock it out everywhere, I've told you that uh, the, the phenotype is, is severe in a male, particularly. Uh, if you knock it out only in the brain, it's exactly the same. Uh, whereas uh, if you knock it out in the periphery and leave it in the brain, at the spinal cord, the nervous system, if you like, then uh, the animals are virtually wild type. So what that tells you is that what it's doing in the brain is more important than what it's doing anywhere else, or at least it's essential what it's doing in the brain uh, compared to what it's doing everywhere else. So the first, this is a, a philosophy meeting, so the top question is entirely unacceptable as a question, and we could spend hours talking about uh, what it means. Uh, but then if I were to say what, it, what is its function, we could have the same argument. Um, but um, uh, you, you know what I mean. Uh, and the way in which you can find this out if you're a molecular biologist is to, is to look at the mutations that cause disease. And now DNA sequencing has revolutionized uh, our, the, the ways in which one can do that. Uh, uh, if you look at the um, bottom row there, causing Rett syndrome, those are single amino acid changes. So we, we don't look at truncations or um, nonsense mutations. We just look at single amino acid changes that cause Rett syndrome, which we consider to be loss of function in this, and, and everything suggests that it is. Um, and you can see that they're concentrated in a read. Uh, if you draw the protein as a bar, which of course it isn't, it's folded up, but if we draw it as a bar, um, then the red region is the methylated DNA binding domain. It's actually the region I showed you the structural bands of DNA. Mutations in that cause Rett syndrome, and those all stop uh, it from binding to, to the DNA. So that's an important function for protein. The other bit is a, a, a region that recruits um, uh, a co repressive the red, the blue, the, sorry, green region. Uh, and interestingly, you can go into the database of, of mutations that are in the general population circulating, that people who you assume do not have Rett syndrome, it's a reasonable assumption. And it's sort of reciprocal. You get very few in the region that binds DNA at all the regions that bind this other, other part. And I'll just tell you that, um, with that, I don't think I'm going to go into it. Uh, no. So, um, maybe I will, so, uh, so, so I'm not going to tell you now. But those two regions are the key, only key regions. Now, you notice there are three mutations outside. We know exactly what they do. They, do. they change the abundance of the protein, so it's essentially not there. Uh, so then, in other words, that's, those are not new regions that we don't know what they do. They're just uh, essential for keeping the protein there. So a lot of work gave rise to this model for how the protein works. Uh, the mutant protein can't bind DNA, uh, and this mu mutations in, the, in there can't bind the, 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 uh, this big machine that represses transcription, stops the genes from being expressed. Uh, is, is, uh, and the explanation is that uh, it's a bridge between these two things. NCore Smart is the green cloud, that's the co repressor, and DNA and the methyl groups are the red dots. Uh, and MECP2 is bridging between them, and if you break the bridge at either end, uh, you get red syndrome. So, just to uh, make clear, you know, this is biology where um, um, publication depends on novelty, and so there's a lot of um, uh, other theories. And I have to say, I think even the people who propose these other models would say that they're the data is less well developed for those mo other models than it is for the one I gave you, which is the <laughs> repressor model. Uh, but nevertheless, they exist. And I would say the most popular one is uh, very often the, the recourse of uh, biologists, which is that uh, things are a multifunctional hub. And, and sometimes they are multifunctional hubs, which is the annoying part. Uh, but um, in fact, I think that most of the evidence suggests that the primary functions of this protein are like in the top. And this is what I was going to tell you, but then remember that I had a slide showing it. We tested this hypothesis in multiple ways. That its primary function was due to that sort of bridge picture, 
And the most brutal way we did that, the more brutal uh, you can test, brutally you can test your hypotheses, the, the better, rather than decorating them with favorable data. Uh, you can uh, remove uh, all of the protein uh, except for those two regions. And uh, the reason why this is a very radical experiment is that uh, the sequence of those proteins, the sequence of amino acids, uh, in, between human and mice is 95% identical. And identity over uh, multiple uh, uh, million years it usually is taken by biologists as a sign of, of necessity. And so you would expect that if you change sequences that have been conserved for that long, uh, it would be disadvantageous. But actually, we, in the middle one, we chopped the ends off. There was no phenotype at all. And the bottom one, uh, we ended up with this mouse, uh, which is um, 46 weeks old. And normally, this is a male mouse, and we put in, in place of its normal MECP2 gene, we took that out, and we put in instead this mini gene, which is a third the length of the total one. And uh, it's not a prize-winning mouse, but it is nevertheless uh, a satisfactory mouse that has lived for, uh, rather than 12 weeks, uh, lived for 46 weeks. Um, actually, this was, that was taken at 46 weeks. It went on to have a more happy life until it was culled. Um, so this is, I realize, too data-rich, but I wanted to make the point that we also know that the function of this protein is to modulate gene expression. We all like switches more than, uh, than modulators. This is a modulator, I'm afraid. Um, but it modulates thousands of genes. So if I show you here, this uh, uh, on the top left picture, um, that's genes, gene expression changes, log twofold change in gene expression when you take away MECP2 plotted against the number of binding sites there are for, the protein, for MECP2. And you can see the genes with the most binding sites go up most. That means they're normally repressed most. And you take it away, they go up more. And you can do the inverse experiment by overexpressing MECP2. And then you take those same genes, and you find that the ones with the most binding sites go down most, and the ones that uh, with the least go up. So for a long time, it wasn't clear whether or not MECP2 was doing anything. And that's because the magnitude of these changes is small. This is wholesale modulation uh, of, of gene expression. And those I just show the picture of the, the neurons in which this was done. These are human neurons. This is mouse, and it just this makes the reason why I'm showing this is just to make the point that these are randomly selected genes. So these are not genes that are specifically affected. We just plotted genes that are randomly selected. And again, you can see the same trends for the same, same genes. They're actually genes all implicated in neurological disorders, but essentially they've been selected at random. And um, so all genes feel the effects when MECP2 is taken away, not just some a subset of target genes. Uh, so this is sort of depressing pharmacologically uh, because um, it means that you're talking about a cell that is profoundly wonky uh, and, um, and uh, there isn't a single or even two or three small targets that we know of yet that will, um, if you were to target them, would ameliorate. So, so, what? Excuse me. What was the range of values on the horizontal axis? Sorry. What was the range of values of the number of sites on the horizontal axis on the plots on the top? Yes. Um, the, the trouble is that this is um, this is sites per gene, mm -hmm. and some genes are absolutely massive, and some genes are really tiny. Mm -hmm. So there is an, an element of averaging that goes on in, in order to be able to take this. So if I could, if some genes have hundreds or okay. thousands of sites, and other genes only have 10. Okay. A, a, a point that sort of is, is relevant is that this is a binding site that occurs once every 100 base pairs throughout the genome. So all genes have multiple sites, and it's just the density uh, per gene that varies. Within the protein coding region? Yes. Yeah, well, I mean, most genes are, are uh, to a great extent, intro. And uh, so with all the transcription unit all the way across their methylation, vertebrates are unusual in having smeared their genes with this, uh, this uh, methylation, uh, which has a price, which is, is mutability, which I'm not going to go into. But it's, uh, methyl C is more mutable than normal C by about tenfold, and many mutations causing human disease are at that site. So, 
Now I move on to this bit, uh, which is, um, uh, that was a sort of molecular side, and, and that's, there are competing hypotheses. I think the best evidence, and more and more people I think would agree with this, but certainly not everybody, is, is that it's acting as a, as a repressor. Uh, and one would like to infer that it's the change in gene expression that is de-optimizing uh, the neurons. So this now is, is more organismal, um, and it's more, it was targeted partly at Rett syndrome. Uh, Rett syndrome is classed as a neurodevelopmental disorder, and that's what Wikipedia says. It's uh, a disorder that affects development of the nervous system leading to an abnormal, abnormal brain function, and the effects tend to last for a person's lifetime. And um, so here, what we knew in the mouse model of Rett syndrome is that there, there was no uh, cell death that you could see. In other words, the number of neurons was the same as you would expect. And, and you can tell that because half of them have inactivated one chromosome and half of them inactivated the other. Half of them have a problem with MECP2 deficiency and the other half don't. The numbers are equal. So if, if, the, if the six cells were dying, you would see fewer. So um, the, the neuron, but the cells, the neurons are small and simplified. And this just sort of shows it's like a target, but it's actually the way in which you look at the branching of neurons. They're sort of small, they're sort of like underpowered neurons. Um, so uh, the real question is, does restoration uh, reverse the symptoms? And I just thought a historical brief, uh, historical digression was appropriate here because um, the view is very strongly no. Uh, and um, this comes from um, early work, Conrad Lorenz, uh, imprinting ducklings. They were the first things the first thing that they saw was him, and so they're imprinted on him, but they lose that, uh, that uh, susceptibility to imprinting and they don't get it back again. And then Hubel and Wiesel did electrophysiology on the developing uh, uh, visual cortex and uh, showed, you know, for example, covering the eye of a kitten during a critical period uh, meant that when you removed the, the cover, you didn't get the sight back because there was a critical time during which you needed to have a visual stimulation. I think more, quite interestingly, this, this taps into a, a general belief, which is, uh, uh, and this has led to the spread of this concept, and I thought this being a, uh, a philosophically uh, orientated meeting as well, uh, this sentence I quite like, the critical period concepts in influenced all sorts of people listed over there. Uh, however, a strong evidential, however, a strong evidential basis for practical application of critical periods to justify social poli policy initiatives, such as early intervention programs for, inter for infants and toddlers, or uh, educational practice like early exposure to music or a second language, are still largely lacking. So there's an element of faith involved that early on everything is plastic, and then, if, uh, particularly the brain, and later on that goes away, and plasticity is more or less lost. So the, the prediction was that a brain that develops in the absence of MECP2 would be permanently defective. And, uh, of course, I wouldn't be telling you this if it wasn't untrue. So this is a mouse um, that just shows you a, a mouse, a male mouse with um, that red syndrome. This is a male, so this would live for another week. Uh, it, has, it doesn't move. It has this tremor. It has arrhythmic breathing, apneas. Um, and uh, when you pick it up by its tail, it hangs in class, which is not, not particular to Rett syndrome, but to neurological disorders in general in mice. And then uh, this is uh, the same mouse, actually, after we have switched back on the gene. So this mouse grew up with the gene switched off, and then we switched it back on. Uh, actually, this, the, the day that movie was on the left was taken. And uh, as I said, it had a, about a week to live, and, and you can see it's dramatically improved, which surprised everybody, and um, including us. We thought we got the mice fixed up, but you no. Know, and now this has been repeated in other labs. This is 2007, so there's pl been plenty of opportunity to shut it down and shoot it down, uh, and uh, it, instead it's been validated. And then the, the females, which I won't show you, um, are the same. The females have these chronic symptoms, which are like Rett syndrome, and you put the gene back, and they uh, they are basically um, restored remarkably, even when they're they've had the symptoms and they're a year old, which is old for now. So this is a this is plasticity in action. Um, 
activation of a dormant MECP2 gene reverses neuro, neuro, neurological phenotypes, including neuronal morphology. So those weakly branched neurons become more sprouty, sprouting branched. And that's something I should add is that if you inactivate the MECP2 gene in an adult mouse, uh, this, this, the emphasis was always on brain development. You needed to develop the brain properly. But if you take it away in an adult, the adult dies. Um, so this is actually a protein required for maintenance of the brain, which brings us to... So, so quite simply, uh, the model is this, that you have uh, in a, in a wild-type animal, those are two genes at the bottom, and they have MECP2 sitting on them, and actually that co-repressor, uh, it's not welded on to the MECP2, it dances on and off. And um, uh, uh, when you take away, uh, leave, leave aside the two sorts of colors, just call them methylation, there are two sorts of methylation which I haven't gone into. If you take away MECP2, then you increase the expression of genes according to how much of the, many of the binding sites for this protein they had. Uh, and now you put back MECP2 and all the methylation is still there. MECP2 has no effect on DNA methylation. It's all there. It just goes back and uh, did what it should have been doing all along. So that's where that's the, the model for how reversibility happens. So MECP2 is required throughout life, but it's dispensable for early brain development. Primary function of, uh, of MECP2 is to recruit the co-repressors um, to highly abundant methylated sites, stress the abundance of these sites. It's not one here and there, have key genes, it's everywhere. Non-canonical methylation, I haven't gone into that, um, but it, that's, that adds to the number of methylations that are there. It's quite interesting in its own right. Um, and it, MECP2 restrains the transcription of thousands of genes in a DNA methylation dependent manner to optimize, presumably, your own gene expression. So variable low density methylation throughout the genome, actually, which everyone thought did nothing because it's, it's a low density, um, 100 base pairs is considered low density of methylation. It's being used here to modulate transcription globally. So that means in the neurons it's functional. So uh, I can't remember how long I've got. Uh, you should try to conclude soon. If it's I should try to conclude. That's okay. So I think that's the, probably the more interesting uh, part of it. Uh, I'm just going to then scoot through. We thought, well, maybe there are other short sequences that occur over and over again that are not epigenetic, but genetic, because in a way um, these proteins don't care if it's epigenetic or genetic on the mark on the DNA. And we thought of base composition, because base composition varies along uh, chromosomes. And we formulated this hypothesis the gene activity is affected by the local base composition of the DNA. And that uh, would be mediated by sequence-specific DNA binding proteins. And our hypothesis was that if you strung together, for example, AATTA, you can see at the top left there, uh, that's what it's, the base composition is shown in black, dark black. You can see it's rather subtle. Uh, but actually, the, if you start stringing together bases of the same sort, uh, AT, then uh, you get much bigger modulation. We screened for proteins that might recognize this. We found SAL4, and SAL4 uh, is an interesting protein. It's actually required to keep stem cells as stem cells. Uh, if you take it away, then they, they don't all suddenly differentiate. They tend to differentiate. It's difficult to keep them because they just want to differentiate all the time. And I realize I'm not explaining these slides properly. I'm just whizzing through them. I'm almost using them as a cue to tell you things without any data because I've got overrun. Um, but we, we mutated the region that's responsible for binding to runs of A's and T's. And um, we, uh, we showed that it was. And then uh, we, we gave the various fingers, only the blue one binds A's and T's. And we um, asked, we gave them random sequence and asked which, which random sequences they liked. And you can see that the blue one, the bottom, ZFC4, with various cycles of binding and PCR up and then bind and then PCR, uh, it, the DNA gets more and more AT rich. And um, the sequences 
that we found that it liked out of this random DNA were those sequences. You see, they're all T's and A's. So it likes anything that has A's and T's in it, which is exactly the sort of thing we were looking for. Does it matter? Uh, well, what we found was that base composition of DNA, again, we're talking about modulation. Oddly, we, we started this off without the expectation we'd get something like MECP2, but actually we did get something a bit like MECP2. It's a modulator. The most GC-rich genes are most affected when it's taken away, and the least GC-rich genes uh, less so. And when we overexpressed it, we could drive it the other way. So this is analogous to the MECP2 expression <coughs> I showed you, where you knock it out, and genes with the most binding sites go up most, and when you overexpress it, the genes with the most binding sites go down most. Same sort of thing. We then tested whether these same genes were changing when cells normally differentiate, so not, no mutations here, and the answer is they do. And, uh, SAL4, which is keeping these ES cells as ES cells, as stem cells that divide happily and don't differentiate, um, if you take it away, uh, then uh, if you start to differentiate them, then SAL4 goes away. And when SAL4 goes away, those GC-rich genes, which determine in this in, enriched in uh, neuronal differentiation pathway, express uh, more, um, and, and, and according to base composition. So, AT-rich genes are, are enriched in gene ontology terms associated with uh, neuronal differentiation. So we have the same sort of thing. Uh, we knew that when you take away, I'm going to skip that for reasons of um, time, when you, when you take away SAL4, embryos don't survive. But when you take away just the um, AT uh, binding region by just making a couple of amino acid changes in it, the protein is still there, that's shown on that plot there, but the embryos where it says HOM, homozygous embryos, which only have uh, SAL4, which can no longer bind uh, AT-rich DNA, they die. Uh, so they mimic taking away the whole protein, even though all you've taken away is the AT binding domain. So our hypothesis is that, uh, which this favors, is that SAL4 is, re is reading base composition and modulating, again, this rather irritating modulation rather than switching uh, gene expression of large numbers of genes in such a way that it makes the cell more reluctant to differentiate. And um, so mammalian genomes contain long domains with variable base composition. We were interested in this because most people think that's a bystander of no functional significance. Uh, and SAL4 came up in a screen for proteins that might interpret base composition. Mutations of the AT binding zinc finger cluster uh, reduce SAL4 genome occupancy, I haven't justified any of this, inactivation of ZFC4 caused precocious differentiation of the ES cells and embryonic lethality in mice. And uh, normally, when cells differentiate, when in the embryo, cell force down-regulated, and this may contribute to, it's not enough, but it may contribute to derepression of AT-rich genes that promote differentiation. In practice, we're always dealing with teams of, uh, of, of uh, tendencies here. So uh, finally, base composition is not merely a passive byproduct of genome evolution. I mean, it may be in causally, but it constitutes a signal that stabilizes cell identity, and indeed it's conserved over quite long periods of time. So these two proteins are uh, MECP2 on the right. It binds methyl C, which is very frequent in the genome, and uh, uh, it recruits this co-repressor, which brings a blanket repression depending on the density of its binding site. And SAL4, remarkably, is the same. Now, though, it binds runs of A's and T's, which are also very frequent in the genome, uh, and uh, recruits this a different co-repressor complex, has a different name, NERD, rejoices in the name of. Um, uh, and it also is repressing genes. In this case, on the right, we stabilize the neuronal cell identity, and without it, then they become um, off, uh, de-optimized. And on the left, we stabilize the stem cell identity just to, until it's ready to differentiate in the embryo. And, and finally, I'll uh, say, sorry for going on a bit, um, just show a picture of the, the people who did this work. I'd just like to highlight Jackie Guy, who, who really drove the reversal experiments all that time ago and stood in my lap, thank goodness. Uh, and um, 
many of the other people here who've um, on the bridge of our uh, boat to the Isle of Arran um, uh, who've contributed this work. Thanks very much. That's a good. That's a good question, and it's a bit contentious. So you can, with transcription, you can inhibit initiation, uh, which means the polymerase never gets to start, and that's a sort of conventional view, sort of based on operons, lack like operon thing like that. Um, but uh, there's also the potential for elongation of the polymerase inhibition, and I favour the second one. We've got some data um, um, that's, that favours that. But it is contentious, and I would say our data is by no means watertight. So it could be either of those two things. I think it's quite technically there are limitations in seeing in, in detecting that, but we're going to try and do a real job on it uh, and, and, and answer that question because it's pretty important. And just one more philosophical question: Why do you think this, this mechanism is utilised, in, in, and why in the neurons so much more than other? Is there a specific function you need to modulate? I just don't understand. Well, neurons, you know, they're pretty special types of cells. They've got huge long processes. They spend ages developing. They're all born before you, the animal is, in case of um, vertebrates. I think, well, mammals anyway. I don't feel safe about all vertebrates. Um, and, and then they have to stay. So actually maintaining their identity is, is a, probably a bigger problem for them because they're post-mitotic. You hardly make any more neurons for the entire period of your life. So keeping the ones that are there healthy and alive is, is, is important. So I think this is probably part of a buffering system, probably not the whole thing that, that, that allows uh, that to, to make sure that happens. So uh, what explains the late onset of the disease, I mean. I'm sorry. So why does the disease uh, start later? No. Uh, also a very important question. I, it, it probably, but not certainly, um, is related to that business of the accumulation. I, sh I, I glossed over the fact that there are two sorts of methylation. There's CG methylation, which I introduced, which is everywhere in all the cell types. And then there's CA methylation mainly in CAC. Now, CG methylation is, you know, there at birth, it remains more or less constant. It's far more constant between cell types than, uh, than is usually given credit for. But um, CAC methylation is not there at birth, and it's added by a DNA methyl transferase called DNMT3A. It's a second reaction, secondary reaction of that. And it goes up, and it, it, that has a pattern to it. It's fascinating stuff. A lot of it not from our lab, I should say, um, but not all of it not from our lab. Um, it's, uh, it tends to be applied wherever genes are not active. So that means most of the genome plus silenced genes. But transcription, it gets, it gets in the way. So you end up then with a pattern in the CA methylation. And that is different between different cellular lineages within the, within the brain. So this is coming up more or less at the time when um, the, the symptoms onset. So there's a, and at the same time as MECP2 itself is coming on. So it's almost like when neurons become mature, this becomes very important. And if it's not there, Rett syndrome is the consequence. So we have time for one question. Uh, <coughs> the, I have a quick question to this um, restoration experiment, which you know, is very impressive. But it implies that the methylation at CBG and also the C CA uh, type sites needs to be faithfully maintained in the absence of MSCB2, such that MSCB2 can rebind you know, once it's re-expressed. Yes. Uh, is, is that what, what you know happens? And if yes. you, could you, if, what happens if you perturb uh, CBG methylation maintenance? Well, we know that if you, if you knock out a DNMT3A, then that's very, very bad. 
Um, so actually the recent paper from the Zogby lab has, has studied uh, this question uh, and you know the consequences are somewhat similar to Rett syndrome but not exactly the same but on the other hand that sort of d removal of that DNA methyltransferase also affects CG methylation mm -hmm. so you can't dis there is nothing that just puts on the CA methylation to, uh, to uh, there but these are post mitotic cells so they're, they're um, they actually have quite high levels of DNA methylation but it seems to be maintained there's no evidence that people have looked that DNA methylation changes when MECP2 is missing. So it's all waiting there for it to go back. Okay. One last question. Uh, what causes the methylation, both of them? Yeah, well, here again, views differ. I think it sort of comes down like rain, uh, and, uh, and uh, it, it doesn't go where the umbrellas are. So, so it's, not that's, related, uh, it's not related that's, to regulation? Uh, MECP2, sorry, DNA methylation is very often invoked as uh, something that uh, affects gene regulation. For example, the activation of genes is methylated and then you take away methylation. There are no really good examples of that. Or, but it's in the germline of uh, textbooks and things like that. <laughs> but, but, but what it is clear is that long-term shutdown is associated with methylation. So on the inactive X, all the CPG ions are methylated. Some germ cell genes are uh, methylated in non-germ cells. So it's, it's a sort of blanket, slightly crude, after the event, consolidator of silence. Thank you.